Well, I think we're here to talk primarily about uh, the fact that my wife and I run a small organic farm and as part of that we do a lot of composting because where we are in Black Pines, uh, which is just north of Kamloops, uh, there's a lot of rocks and in fact our farm is mostly on rocks which is why we call it Stone Ground Farm. That's the only kind of ground we have. And so we've had to build soil on top of the rock in order to grow things and uh, an absolutely essential part of that has been composting. Because I teach here at Thompson Rivers University, I have access to all of the outlets on campus uh, and from them each day I pick up um, buckets of used coffee grounds which go into the compost pile. I also pick up used brewing grains from BA Brewmaster. I have relationships with a number of people who raise animals, sheep and horses um, to get manure from their farms and add that to my composting operation. And up until very recently I was also getting um, somewhere in the vicinity of 800 to 1,000 pounds a week of used brewing grains from the Noble Pig Brewery here in Kamloops. It comes out to it when we're really rolling along it's about 30 metric tons a year. 30 metric tons would uh, pretty easily make a compost pile that would be as tall as your average four-wheel drive pickup that it wasn't hugely jacked up uh, and also maybe as long as about two or three pickups. That requires that essentially every day, five days a week, I'm bringing home uh, anywhere from a few buckets to an entire truckload to a tandem axle dump trailer full of things that are going to go in the compost pile. It requires being a little bit focused. I'm not so sure we're actually organic farmers. We may just be composters. My wife Penny Powers and I started out with the intent of growing enough food for ourselves for a year. Since we're not officially organic certified, I guess I'd have to say we're little o organic, not big o organic. We made that commitment <coughs> to wanting to be able to grow enough food that we could by preserving it somehow and uh, there's lots of ways to preserve food but by preserving the food we'd have enough to eat most of what we wanted to eat for a year granted we'd have to probably trade for some stuff with neighbors because we don't uh, didn't then we do have chickens now but we didn't have animals of any kind so it was you know fruits nuts berries vegetables that sort of thing uh, we were actually at the time vegan um, it, since then you know after reviewing some research and doing some cautious experimentation we're we're, we're actually committed omnivores but I do understand and sympathize with the vegan perspective um, but we made that commitment and then looked at the ground and said you were not going to grow much on this and so that was when we started the process of building the farm from the ground up and then uh, so actually that's why I say we may be composters not farmers because the stuff from the the stuff that we harvest is actually kind of a side effect of all the other stuff we've done to the place. <laughs> Industrial food was the big one. Both of us enjoy making, processing, growing our own food and knowing what went into it, knowing where it came from, having that personal relationship with it and and that was what drove us to do that was just meeting our goal of growing our own food for the most part um, but at the same time some of the things that go along with that of course are you know if you can walk down the hill and carry a bucket of potatoes back up the hill in your hand um, you know those potatoes don't have to be trucked in from Saskatchewan somewhere um, so there was an awareness too that the carbon footprint of the farm would be a lot smaller if we did did things by hand and, and grew a lot of our own food there. The initial challenge was to get enough ground prepared that we could actually grow more than just a few tomato plants and some carrots. A lot of it has been a very strongly reinforced awareness of just exactly how much work is involved in doing this. I and mean, it's not, you don't just go out and get some buckets of stuff and dump it in a pile and you know next spring it's beautiful loamy compost and you can stir it into your garden beautiful plants automatically pop up you know no you've got weeds to deal with you've got um, I've already referenced you know the you know, the possibility of bringing home 10,000 pounds of stuff at a time and 
you know, if, so if you're gonna if you're gonna haul a trailer load with ten thousand pounds of horse manure in it, um, you know that requires that you've got a truck that can pull a trailer that has ten thousand pounds of horse manure in it. You also probably, unless you have a lot of people working with you, you're gonna need a tractor that has a pretty big tiller on it, and it's not carbon neutral. And I I sometimes think that. You know, when we look at farming, we just have to kind of say, yeah, there's a huge input of fossil energy on the farm. It's either, but you would need a, a family of 12 or 13 people to, to run even a small place, you know, and, and make it work, which carries its own risks, right? Mm -hmm. But um, one of the challenges has been you know, people people some people look at it and they say wow i've always wanted to live off grid the way you do and i say we're not off grid <laughs> we've got bc hydro we have you know we depend on the petroleum industry for gasoline and diesel and and we depend on major equipment industries for the equipment we use on the farm and yeah i do a lot of things with hand tools and you know, I harvest grain with a scythe, and I cut hay with a scythe, and pick it up with a rake, and stack it in a rick instead of baling it. But if I was trying to f to put up enough hay to feed a herd of cattle for the winter, no, I would not be able to do that. So that's the big challenge: is that you just you either go on a really small scale, and you accept the fact that. If you can't do it yourself with your own two hands, or you can't get enough hands together to get it done, it's just not going to happen. Or you say, you know, I want this to work, and I want it to work on a certain scale, and even though our scale is essentially a family size scale, um, it's going to take reaching into that other the, you know, non-sustainable side of things, and but that's that's kind of my biggest, um, my biggest intellectual res wrestling match is with that whole, you know, if I need to get this done and I need to get it done today, I'm going to have to crank up the tractor and go down there and use the loader or whatever, and uh, and sometimes I think, wow, you know, if I just went down to the store and bought the potatoes, it probably would ultimately cost me a little less than you know maintaining the farm and all the equipment to grow the potatoes but then i look at this next weekend when i'm going to be digging potatoes and i've already dug a few and i'm thinking you know i'm really looking forward to getting those potatoes out of the ground and getting them in the root cellar and eating them all the way through until next summer we're in that space between gardening and farming you know every year something does really well and something else doesn't do well a couple of years ago we had an almost complete failure in the onion crop and we were fortunate the year before that we had had this real boom year in the onions and we had about three or four times as many onions as we could use we ended up drying a bunch of them so we had containers of dried onions which got us through another year yeah we do occasionally have surplus i always pass that along we had a great year for pears uh, we had a great year for plums this year so far um, and after we had done as much as we wanted it went to the food bank you know, so there's there's a social good there of donating some stuff to the food bank. Plus, as I said, we trade for stuff. I've got a guy in the vicinity where we live who has publicly said, I would crawl over broken glass to get to your broccoli. But he raises turkeys. So usually we get our Thanksgiving turkey from him in exchange for you know, several buckets full of broccoli that he and his family then process and freeze and save for the winter. The thing you learn as a farmer is that if you're just out there growing plants or raising animals, you really don't have any connection to people. You have to grow community. And, and that's another thing that takes time is, you know, creating the conditions within which those community relationships can grow. Frankly, you know, if I had, if I spent more time on the farm than I do here at the university, which during the school year I don't, I probably still wouldn't have, feel like I had a lot of time to grow the community. I did pretty much depend on my wife for that. She's, you know, she's full time on the farm and um, she makes a lot of those connections with the people that we, that we trade and do business with on a regular basis. The balance has to be around an entire year.
January is the time we start the onions, for instance. That takes a little bit of time and then some attention for a while because they're out in the greenhouse. And you know, to save having to heat the greenhouse, we bring the seedlings in at night, which means, okay, you've, you've got this new piece of routine. Every morning you take them out to the greenhouse, every night you bring them in from the greenhouse. And then that kind of goes away after a while as the weather warms up and the seasons begin to change. It, you plant things and then it's, it's not entirely step out of the way and let them grow. I mean, you have to get down there and do stuff. But you, you kind of fit that into your routine. The, the hardest part of the whole enterprise is right now. It's, a lot of stuff is ready to go. I mean, yeah, the, you know, some stuff is ready early and that's good. I mean, we plan for that. And so we've been, we have been picking and processing and saving and trading with things all the way since early June. The cherries were early this year. The Saskatoons were early this year. And we had uh, a lot of the fruit and stuff was already out of the field and in the freezer, in the dryer or whatever, canned, pickled, made jam, whatever we do with it, right? But now it's like, okay, well, I've got a bunch of dry beans to get in, and I've got a bunch of potatoes to get in, and I've got squash to get in, and the tomatoes are finishing off, and and then I've got to clean everything up, and then I have to get up on the terraces on the hillsides and till those terraces to prepare the seed bed for winter, because uh, we do a lot of garlic, so we have that going in, and, and other winter crops, and then and then you get you know, between the middle of October and about the middle of January, you get a little bit of a break, right? And then it all starts all over again. But there are times of intense effort. You know, last night, in one of our terraces that we had fallowed this year, planning to use it next year and fallow a different terrace, we had this massive flush of shaggy mean mushrooms. And I had a late night last night teaching, and so by the time I got home, well, okay, we've got to do something with it. So we had a quick supper, and went down there and picked a bunch of mushrooms and then uh, my wife and I prepared them and got them in the dryer and then this morning packed them up and got them into the root cellar but you know there's another flush down there today and we're going to go down and get some more mushrooms and do those along with everything else we're trying to get done <laughs> but you can't procrastinate you can't say well you know I'll pick those mushrooms this weekend they're not going to be there they're going to be little inky blots in the dirt by next weekend yeah. So if you want them, you got to get them now. Yeah. But nature doesn't wait for me, unfortunately. It just, I don't know why, but. <laughs> and they're really so simple that I think most people already know them anyway. Yeah. You know, if it's close enough to walk, walk. If it's on and you're not using it, turn it off. <laughs> if you can do it with hand tools instead of with a power tool, do that. I mean, those are pretty simple guidelines, really. Somebody might argue, does it make any sense for somebody to say, drive a vehicle 80 kilometers round trip in a day, and then, you know, maybe walk to an errand, like to mail a letter or something from their office. And I think that it's easy to get target locked on, well, you know, you. You might as well just drive because it's not going to increase your carbon footprint that much more anyway just to drive. But that only looks at one benefit. If you look at a number of benefits, like the walk might be good for your mental health. The walk certainly is good for your physical health. You are saving a little bit of gas. You are getting out and appreciating what other people are doing. And frankly, the more people see people out doing stuff that doesn't involve locking yourself into a steel cage and driving it somewhere, the more it becomes something that they think of as being possible for themselves. I tend to focus a lot on what are those small things we can do, recognizing that the counter-argument is, well, you're only doing a little bit. I mean, that's not going to change anything. Well, that may be true. On the other hand, more people doing small things does have an effect. I don't know and won't even speculate on whether that effect ultimately is the large effect we would like to see, but it does at least raise awareness. And I think that's the crucial point. You never know who you might bump into on that walk. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Better than bumping into them with your car, right? Yeah. So no. <laughs> People can begin where they are. If all you have is an apartment, people do grow tomatoes on their balcony. Yeah, you're not going to grow enough tomatoes for 
an entire year, but you might grow a few tomatoes that show up in your salads. That has many effects. It gives you a very personal awareness of how much food did I get off of this little tiny area that I was able to devote to it? How much food do I need for a year? What would I do if I didn't have that available and had to grow it all on my own? And, and that's not an excuse to throw your hands up and say, well, I might as well go down and dive into the river right now, but rather to say, well, maybe I should be thinking about supporting initiatives to save farmland instead of put developments on it or be activist from whatever perspective you you think that's useful we're right at the moment of course still and probably for the foreseeable future embroiled in this whole kinder morgan trans mountain pipeline thing which doesn't go through our property yet but if they put it in it will it's going to go right straight through the center of our orchard the orchard will be gone as will uh, one of the gardening terraces. It's difficult to live in a constant state of rage. They've had a, an agricultural economist come and look the place over, a contracted uh, guy from the University of Victoria. And uh, he and his crew came and took measurements and looked at stuff and pic they took pictures and mapped things out and took soil samples. And he said, you know, I've never been on a farm where the soil tested absolutely optimal in all respects. And I just looked at him and I said, well, you're on a farm where the soil tests optimal in all respects. And thank you for recognizing that. Now let's acknowledge how upset I am that you guys are gonna put a pipeline. You wanna put a goddamn pipeline right through the middle of the best soil on the whole farm. And you're telling me, oh yeah, well, we'll fix that up. It'll be the same just as it always was, but you can't put an orchard back there. We're gonna have to move you know, the orchard. I mean, they looked at it, came up with a plan to move the orchard up the hill, which is going to require just on our property, several hundred thousand dollars of work. And a friend of mine who's worked in the oil business said, yeah, you know, you're one property owner and it's gonna cost several hundred thousand dollars to put a pipeline across probably 300 feet of your property. But the first load of oil through that pipeline is gonna pay all those bills for them. You know, how can you fight that? I mean, you have to fight it, but if you, if you believe that you have to fight it, you have to fight it, but it's huge. That gets to that whole frustration and that whole anxiety about trying to live in a sustainable way while yet outside forces are really trying to tear that down. We live in a place where energy infrastructure can be a little bit precarious. Just last weekend we had a power outage for about an hour and a half after a thunderstorm. So one of the things we have tried very hard to do is to make the conditions for resilience, gathering the food we grow and processing things, preserving it. Yeah, we have a freezer, but we also have a root cellar. I have a chainsaw and I have a hydraulic wood splitter. I also have axes and splitting mauls and crosscut saws. I have hand tools and I have power tools, alternative lighting sources, a couple of wood stoves to cook on and uh, another wood stove for heating. We hear more and more about infrastructure breaking down because governments don't invest in infrastructure anymore. Not that I would really want to have to spend a huge amount of time pumping my own water by hand out of our well and making candles to see with and you know doing a lot of things by hand, but I guess, you know, if I have to, I will. I also have to acknowledge that I'm extremely fortunate that, that both my wife and I worked in professions that allowed us to make the kind of money that allows us to be flexible. Money is just another resource, really. It's just a way of transferring energy from point A to point B, but if you don't have that and you have to depend on whatever it is you can afford, you have to look around for those opportunities to be resilient and they you may be less resilient if you have fewer resources. Ivan Illich. He wrote uh, a number of books in the late 60s and into the 70s about what was then called the appropriate technology movement. So if you're thinking of, you know, permaculture, you're thinking of uh, writers like Wendell Berry and Rachel Carson, E.F. Schumacher, uh, some of those people who said, you know, industrial society is killing us. 
and pollution is killing us and we need to pay attention. And Ivan Illich, one of the books that was a, a huge factor for me was Tools for Conviviality. Also uh, his essay, Energy and Equity. A number of other books, including uh, a book that he wrote that was highly critical of our education system called Deschooling Society. Um, but his point gets back to what I said about you know what you can do. It's if it's on and you don't need it, turn it off. You know, look at your world and say, what is it I'm doing, and what am I doing it with? What are the tools I'm using? And question that. Can I repair the tools I'm using? Can I, if need be, make a, a piece of that tool and install it and get that tool working again? Whatever it is, whether it's a shovel or a hammer that needs a new handle or a refrigerator or your car. And his point was that technology really should be built so that the user can make it what they want and can keep it running and can you know can repair it that implies a huge investment in a different kind of technology really i mean our cars would be a lot different if we had to repair them ourselves we'd still be driving model t's which would be fine personally <laughs> he saw this increasing specialization where you had to have just the right tool to do the job which required parts that could only be made in a large factory, you know, and once the tool broke, you couldn't fix it and it was cheaper to go buy a new one. That's not changed. We still see that. There are still, you know, you can still find good tools, but you really have to look for them. Plan your things so that human energy input, which is sustainable, is the primary energy input to what you're doing. And he said, you know, sometimes we do have to use fossil fuel, or we may have to use a large tractor to pull a stump out of the ground or something. Okay, fine, we do that. But acknowledge that that has a special place in what we do that doesn't have a central place in what we do. That was a big realization for me when I read that. My mother grew up in, before the Great Depression. She was born in 1918 and grew up on a farm in North Dakota. And uh, she was a thoroughly modern woman. I mean, she believed that our ancestors fought and died so we could have Campbell's soup and white bread. And she used to laugh at the back to the landers. You know, what do they want to go back to pit toilets and kerosene lamps for? I lived that. I know what, that, what that's like. Why do they want to do that? Well, because they realized doesn't always have to be, but it can be a, a more reasonable way to live, lower energy input. It comes out of uh, Ivan Illich's energy and equity, and it's something to the effect of, in our modern world, we judge the success of someone by the number of energy slaves that they have. Energy slaves can be the work of people who have created the goods that we have. It can be the the coal tan miners in the Congo who face torture and death and exploitation to give us the minerals that make our cell phones work. Energy slaves can be the gas that we buy and the choices we make about how we use that gasoline. It can be power-hungry appliances, whatever. That observation made in the late 1960s still holds true today, and maybe even more so. His essential point was that any other form of energy besides the energy contained in human muscles is just a surrogate for humans. Having a lifestyle that requires us to use a lot of fossil fuels, a lot of equipment, a lot of inputs from various places. That may be to our personal benefit, but that represents, in effect, this huge group of people who would be working on my farm, who aren't, <laughs> but they really kind of are. But you know, they're producing whatever. They're working in the oil industry, they're working in the auto industry, They're producing the chemicals and inputs that we use. We really are, when we look around the world and look at our place in the world economy, we're, we're at an apex. We're 
definitely all of us, whether it's where do our clothes come from to where does our food come from, we, all of us are complicit in energy slavery. And I'm not celebrating that. If you can't honor the inputs that other people put into your life, then I'm sorry, but I think you're drifting away from humanity. I don't think you're acting ethically. It's so easy not to look past the surface. A couple of years ago, I somewhat inadvertently traumatized an entire classroom full of university students by pointing out that as owners of smartphones, probably complicit in the deaths of between five and ten coltan miners. They had never even heard of that. They didn't even know what coltan was, columbium tantalum. And so I explained it to them, and then they kind of said, well, you know, yeah, but what do we actually use our phones for? You know, <laughs> sending a text to somebody, what do you want to do tonight? Or listening to music, or browsing a website, or doing their banking. And they said, well, what can we do about it? Do you think we should get rid of our phones? I said, well, you know, that's a personal decision. But I think you want to think about what are you actually using the technology for? And if you can't square your use of the technology with the devastation it wreaks in other people's lives, don't use the technology. You do have to keep that in mind, I think. Do you have cell phones? I do. How do I square that? I square that number one by trying to be thoughtful about how I use it. I'm a journalist. Having that ability to grab a box which has a small notebook, my phone in it, and it has a couple of other things to be able to cover a story, grab some video, do what I need to do from the scene. Outside of that, um, you know, I don't really have no need for it. And so a lot of the time it's off. If I weren't working in this context, I'd get rid of it. We do rationalize our use. I rationalize my own use of the technology. I try to rationalize mindfully if such a thing is possible. <laughs>